Good morning. Welcome to Southside. We're glad that you are here to worship with us today. If you're a guest with us, we would, um, if you, if you, we want you to feel at home. We just love for you to um, ask anybody around you if you need something, if you need any help. Um, it is so good to be able to come here and to worship a great God who deserves all the glory because He has done all the work. Uh, we're going to open in in reading God's Word, Isaiah 52 through 53. And then we'll begin our continuing worship. Isaiah 52, 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see, and that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he, he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughters, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And for his generation, who considered that he was cut off, out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this time you've allowed us to come and to worship you. I pray, Lord, that as we begin to worship, you would clear our hearts and minds of any distractions and anything that would keep us from giving you the attention and the honor and glory that you deserve. I pray, Lord, that as we open your word, you'll shine a light and help us to see something that we can apply to our lives this week. I pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together this morning as we start to sing. Hebrews 13, 12 says, Jesus suffered to make people holy through his own blood. Let's keep that in mind as we sing the wonderful cross this morning.
Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church family. I wanted just to uh, welcome you here to Southside. I am not your pastor. Uh, if, you've, if you happen to be a visitor, I'm not our pastor, but we have a wonderful pastor who every once in a while gets a day off. Uh, and so I'm very thankful to be able to be here and, uh, and preach today. But I would say this to you. If, if there's something that I preach or say really dumb that just uh, you don't understand, or if I say something I preach and you, and you go, you know what, I'd like to learn a little bit more about that. As soon as our worship service is over today, I'm going to be in this room right across the hallway. Uh, and I'd just love to talk with you there, pray with you, or whatever that might be, okay? Um, so enough about me and, and that kind of thing. We're going to go to the Lord now in, uh, in prayer. Our great and mighty God, we come before you this day. We recognize you as good and great. You are mighty. You are holy. You are sovereign. You are without beginning and without end. You are truth. You are kind and gentle and lowly, yet you are mighty and strong and victorious. You are Almighty God. You are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God, you have revealed yourself to us as Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And it's you that we bow down to this day. Lord, we know that we are imperfect beings. God, that we sin against you. We have sinned against you. Lord, we wrestle with life. We struggle. We fear things. We, we fear death. God, we wrestle with illnesses, with other people, with life situations, with finances. God, there's so much on our plate that we try to juggle and wrestle with. God, we get angry at other people. We yell at our spouse. We yell at our children. And God, for that, we're sorry. Lord, we thank you that there's forgiveness in Christ. Lord, we thank you that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We thank you for the church, this body of believers, Lord, that is family. Thank you for lives that are intertwined here. Lives that we share the good and the not so good. Lord, with brothers and sisters that we can cry with and laugh with and rejoice with and sorrow with. Lord, we thank you for life. Lord, on this planet, we thank you for the blessings that you give us. Lord, that many times we just take for granted place that we can sleep, food on the table. God, please sear into our hearts, Lord, thankfulness for every blessing. And God, we are a needy people. Lord, we lay before you today our, all the things that are consuming us this day, whether it's a doctor's visit this week, a meeting with our boss, some kind of confrontation, something that's really weighing us down, Lord. We lay them at your feet. We ask that you would extend grace to us, Lord, as we face this week. And Father, we pray that now as we continue this time of worship that your son's name would be exalted 
And that we would be able to worship you in spirit and in truth from gracious hearts. Remembering what you've done for us and continue to do for us. Lord, thank you for a new year, another year. May we be close to you each day, we ask in Christ's name. Amen and amen. As you stand again to sing, we're going to sing this old hymn this morning, and I love the chorus. It says, moment by moment, I'm kept in his love. And we all know that some of those moments are good and some of them are bad. Um, and yet, when we are in Christ, he doesn't let go of us. So let's stand together as we sing moment by moment this morning.
Let me head on out. What an amazing song. Thank you, choir, for singing that. Grace. Did you catch one of, those, one of the verses that said, the same for the sinner and the saint. Uh, at the same time, a sinner and a saint, how can that be? And that is just an amazing thought uh, that the grace we receive, we're both sinners and saints uh, simultaneously. Well, anyway, again, thank you for allowing me to be here this morning. Um, we know that God clearly teaches us in the sixth commandment that uh, we should not murder, right? I think we all understand that. One of the Ten Commandments, you shall not murder. But I think there are two things that every Christian should be allowed to kill. The first one of those is kudzu. I think kudzu is a communist conspiracy to take the world over. I despise me some kudzu. But the second thing that Christians are freed and, in fact, are already licensed to kill is sin. Now, I want to give two disclaimers before we really get going here. One is, I've been greatly influenced in my life by a 17th century, uh, 17th century theologian, uh, Puritan theologian, John Owen. And one of his works that uh, really influenced my life, and in particular as we talk about this, this text today, uh, is a treatise that he wrote entitled, On the Mortification of Sin. So if you, for some reason, you like kind of like this sermon, and you, I want to go a little bit deeper, I'd like to take a deep dive into that, uh, look up John Owen. Not John Owen Butler, who is the pastor at Presbyterian Church down the road here, but John Owen of the 17th century. Uh, you might like to read that. But the second disclaimer I want to give is we're really just going to parachute into a text today, right? I, I'm not here every week like Zach is just preaching through a book of the Bible, so we don't have a, a big reservoir of background material that, that helps us here. So we're just kind of jumping down in there. So I wanted to give just a, a little bit of context of where we are. We're going to be in what I believe and what many believe is the greatest book of the Bible, and we're going to be in what I believe and many believe to be the greatest chapter in the greatest book of the Bible. That's Romans chapter 8. So as we go parachuting into Romans chapter 8, and I would invite you, if you have a Bible, to, to open your Bibles now to Romans chapter 8. Just a little bit of background here. The Apostle Paul is, uh, in the first three chapters, or the first three and a half chapters of Romans, uh, he has built a very strong logical case for all of us being guilty before God. All of us are sinners. All of us de deserve separation in hell from God. Not just Jews, but Gentiles as well. That's, the, that's Romans chapter 3, the, the first half of chapter 3. Then beginning in the middle of chapter 3 and going through chapter 4, Paul describes God, a, a holy, righteous God, making righteous those of us who are unrighteous by His righteousness. That's a lot of righteous stuff there, right? But that's what God is doing in, in, in chapter 3, the end of chapter 3 and chapter 4. He's showing how that we unrighteous people are made holy in God's eyes by the righteousness of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's chapter 3 and chapter 4. Chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8, essentially what Paul is doing there, he is showing us the great glorious blessings that befall upon us who are believers in Christ. Then in chapter 8 in particular, he, he's talking about the Holy Spirit and the blessings that, that come upon us because when we are dead in Christ, we, we, are, we are, are dead to ourselves, the Holy Spirit of God now takes up residence in our life. And so that's, the, that's sort of the context of where we are. Today we're going to be in one verse. Romans chapter 8, verse 13, and in honor of God's Word, I know you just got comfortable sitting down, but I would ask you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word and as I pray. These are Paul's words, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verse 13, say this. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit... You put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. Read that one more time. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. 
What we're going to do today, I'm going to try to just explain this text a little bit by answering five questions, five rather subjective questions that I came up with, but I, I think it will help us work our way through this text, a very powerful text it is. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, please um, be exalted this day. Exalt the name of Christ. Lord, you, you know the needs of everyone here today. So, Father, may, may this day be about you. Please, God, speak to us clearly. Lord, we ask you remove distractions. Lord, we ask that you remove what, it, what might be distracting us and calling us away or, or we might tend to be thinking about. But Lord, zero us in. Focus us, God, for these minutes that we're together now. Lord, we ask that those without Christ might come to an understanding of their dire predicament and their need for a Savior. Lord, those that are, um, that are believers that we too would be reminded, Lord, of, of what's going on in our souls, the battle for, for our souls. We just love you this day, praise you now in Christ's name, amen. And you may be seated. So we're going to look at five questions, attempt to answer five questions about Romans 8 verse 13. The first question is this, what is meant by the words according to the flesh and the deeds of the body. If you look there in that sentence, the, the, the deeds of the body according to the flesh, what is meant by that? Simply put, what is meant by these terms is indwelling sin. Indwelling sin. Paul has talked about that in chapter 7. You remember this. It's a very familiar passage. Here's what he says in, in chapter 7, verse 21. Paul says, so I find it to be a law, or just the way things are, are always going, the way things seem to go, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at my hand. Can you relate to that? When I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Let me give you a word picture. This is it. The Bible tells us that, that our hearts by nature, and when I, mean, when I speak of heart, he's talking about the, the center of our emotions, the center of our decisions, the center of our will, that, that which is who we are. The Bible says by nature we are born with, with hearts of stone, cold, dead hearts that are not receptive to God. That is not who we are. We're not born naturally to, to, to allow God in and to understand the things of God. In fact, the Bible tells us that the natural man has a stony heart and his heart is impenetrable. The non-believer doesn't desire to fight against sin. The, the, the natural man has a hard heart. But listen, Christians, those of us who've been born into the kingdom of God, those of us who have received Christ, Christians are given new hearts. That's what the Bible says. We're, we're given hearts of flesh, not hearts of stone, so that now we're able to understand, we're able to receive the things of God. We've, given, we've been given that new heart, and we understand now, hey, the light comes on, and we understand, man, I'm, in a dire, I'm in dire straits. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. We put our hearts in Christ, but listen, when we give our lives to Christ and we're born again and we've been forgiven, right? He gives us this new heart. Listen to this. Our new hearts, though, are not pristine. What I mean by that is another word picture. We still have, listen, Christians, we still have this indwelling sin in us that I'm going to liken to a, a heart cancer. Think about that for a minute. Not, not, not your physical heart cancer, but a diabolical, fiendish, demonic kind of evil that wants to cling to us, to, to cling to every fiber of our being that is left over. And my friend, my fellow believers, 
You and I will wrestle and struggle against this indwelling sin until the day God calls us home. So that's what he's referring to there when he's talking about the deeds of the body. And hopefully it'll make sense uh, later. But question number two, what does this text then teach us? Just looking at this text, what does it teach us? Well, you might understand, first of all, that verse 13 is divided into two parts. And both of these parts are kind of like if-then sentences, right? If you live according to the flesh, then you will die, which is a paradox in itself. But if you, by the Holy Spirit, are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So they are if-then statements. <clears throat> in the original language, the, the Greeks would call this a first-class conditional sentence, meaning it's true. It's not just hypothetical if, if this or whatever. It's like you could read it this way, since then. So if you want to read this, this sentence in that way, let, let's follow along. Here's my interpretation. Since you, and I would say here you as an unbeliever, since you live and you keep living according to the flesh, you're actually dying. That's the point he's making here. Since you, an unbeliever, you live according to the flesh, you are already dying. However, on the other hand, since you, that is the believer, since you, the believer, by the Spirit, are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live eternally. Not just forever, but abundantly. Also in this sentence, there are verbs, and these verbs, I, I, I was an awful English student. Terrible. Got to college and took Latin, and I, was, I learned more Latin in Latin, in, in, more English in Latin class than any, anywhere. But I was still just so ignorant of that. I wish I would have studied harder in school. Y'all young and study hard now. It'll be easier later. But anyway, these verbs, they are, uh, you know, verbs have tenses and all those kind of things. They also have moods. And these verbs in this sentence, they're, they're in what's called the indicative mood. In other words, they, they are descriptive, they are not prescriptive. Prescriptive mood would be, would be imperative, it would be a command. It would say, you do this and therefore that. You do this and therefore that. But that's not what's going on here at all. This is describing. It's describing reality and it's not commanding the readers to do anything. This will make sense a little later, but this is, this is so important. So here are four takeaways in from this text. Number one. When you repented and when you received Christ, sin's penalty no longer applies to you. The penalty of sin is dealing with the wrath of an angry, holy God. A lot of people want to say, well, you know, the penalty of sin is hell. Well, it is, but look, it's not the devil you're facing, it's God. The wrath of a holy God. But listen, when you've given your life to Christ, you see Jesus already paid that penalty for you. Praise God, in Christ you've been set free from the penalty of sin. That's number one. A second takeaway from this text is this. Until we're taken home to heaven, we're left on this earth, and we are being transformed daily by God to be more and more like Christ. And though we've been given these new hearts and we've been redeemed, we've been saved from sin's penalty, we still have indwelling sin, indwelling sin in our heart. One person uh, puts it this way. He said, you know, World War II, it really ended on D-Day. When the Allies stormed the beaches of Normandy and France, the, the World War II was basically over. It was done. But we know it didn't really officially end until what? Until V-Day. So there were battles that continued from D-Day to V-Day, but basically when the Allies stormed the beach and established the beachhead at Normandy, it was all over, man. And listen, the, in, a, in a similar kind of way, when Christ died on Calvary 2,000 years ago, giving His life a ransom for our sin, the war was won. It was over. But we're living in that time between the, al the already and the not yet. The war is won, but we're still in a battle, and the battle rages. For Christians, our war ended on D-Day. But number three, it's the third takeaway from this text. 
a distinguishing characteristic of a true Christian is that he or she is by the Holy Spirit, listen, this is important, by the Holy Spirit, he or she is continually mortifying indwelling sin. I'll just say that again in a different kind of way. You want to know if you're a genuine believer? You want to know if you're really a Christian? Then you, by the Holy Spirit, are continually killing sin. You are continually killing sin. Now, don't take it this way. Look, if you're not a Christian here today, and you go, well, okay, I need to be a Christian. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk out of here with this dogged kind of determination that I'm going to go out here, and I'm going to start living right. I'm going to do everything right. And the stuff that's wrong, I'm going to quit doing that. And the stuff that's right, I'm going to do that. Listen, you'll fail. You'll fail before the day's over. You will fail before the hour's over. Because you can't do enough to please God. You can't do enough right, and you can't not do enough bad. None of us can. That's why Christ came and He lived a perfect life for those who would believe in Him. That he would, his death would be counted for hours. It's like this. And we're talking now that the proof of a believer is the fact that we're continually killing this indwelling sin, this, 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 this vile thing that, that clings to us like a heart cancer. It's out to get you, right? When we lived in Virginia, in our neighborhood, uh, we lived in this residential area surrounded by a lot of woods. And part of the, the area, part of our neighborhood had been infested by kudzu. I mean, it was like everywhere growing up. You couldn't even see the telephone poles or anything because it's just kudzu everywhere. Some people really like that, but you know, it just to me, it just takes away from the beauty of the trees and so forth. Now, our yard, our property, uh, we, we didn't own much land, but behind our house, man, there was like thousands of acres. And it was beautiful, and we didn't have any kudzu. And I was determined, doggone determined, we are not going to have kudzu. It is not happening here. But one day I'm out there in the yard, and I look down at the, down at the bottom of the hill. Our, our house set up here and had the deck, and you can look way down the hill. And down there, growing up in a tree, was kudzu vine. Man, it infuriated me. I was like, no, man, because if one kudzu vine gets there, guess what? That thing's going to spread, and it's going to be all over here pretty quickly. I climbed the tree. I grabbed hold of that vine, I climbed down from the tree, and I pulled it and pulled it and pulled it. I had to, had to trace that thing to where that root went in there, and I was able to pull that root out, but that wasn't enough for me. I was like, man, I don't think I got it all. I went and got Roundup. I got a big old bottle of Roundup. I mean, it was like the high, super-duper kind of you know, concentrated Roundup. I don't even think I mixed it with water. I'm like, this bad boy's going to die. And I just like, boop, 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 boop. Man, I poured that roundup all over there, and then I went up on the back of my deck, and I sat there, and I said, I dare you to grow. Like an old man sitting on his yard, you know, watching kids. Get off my lawn! That's the way I was with this kudzu. It's like, you are not going to come here. Y'all, do you understand this? When God changes you, when He comes into your life and He turns you and you've repented of your sin and you turn and trust Christ, this is the new disposition of those who have been saved by grace. Over the course of your life, you're beginning to learn that, that sin is, is a hated thing. And I don't want sin in my life. It's unpleasing to God. And just like me uh, wanting to kill that kudzu, that's the way we are with sin. I, want to, I don't want sin in my life. Continually killing sin is not optional for the believer, it's standard issue. A fourth thing we'll take from this text. This verse does not teach that you'll lose your salvation if you don't adequately wage war with sin. It teaches this. Christians, by nature, are waging war with sin. Do you get the difference? Do you get it? Not perfectly. We're not perfectly waging war. But we are waging war with sin. You and I will never reach the day that sin isn't dwelling in us until the day we leave this earth. Question number three. See what I did there? Yeah, I could have given you a 20-point sermon, but you can have like a four-point sermon with all these little mini things in there. We're, we're slick. Preachers are slick. Question number three. Since killing sin is now part and parcel to who I am in Christ... Do I just simply now let go and let God? 
Is that what I do? In other words, it's my nature now. God has changed me. I'm now a believer. Do I just kind of let go and let God and it's just going to kind of happen by osmosis? The answer is absolutely not. Listen to what Paul says in Colossians chapter 3. Just follow along. He says this. He says, if, or you could say since then, you have been raised with Christ. Listen, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2, he says this, set your minds where? On things that are above, not on the things of the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Listen, he, then he, this is a command, y'all. This isn't just a, a you know, suggestion. This is a command. Put to death, mortify, kill, therefore, what is earthly in you. Kill it. Sexual immorality. Impurity. Passion. Evil desire. And covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God... Is coming, he says. In these you too once walked. You were a non-believer. And this is what your life consisted of. This is characteristic of your life. This is the way you walked. But now, but now, you must put them all the way. You get that? This is what he's done for us. He saved us. It's not by works that we can do that we're saved, but because we're saved, we're commanded, now you got to do this. You want to do this. He, says, he goes on, he says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its praxis. John Owen, who I mentioned earlier, I'll just, he writes, quote, Paul, in speaking to believers, thus challenges the Colossians, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And then he asks this, Do you mortify? Do you make it your daily work? You must always be at it while you live. Do not take a day off from this work. Always be killing sin. Or it will be killing you. Your position in Christ and the new life that you have in Him does not excuse you from this work. So let me just kind of put this in plain, plain like everyday life, what's going on here. You're a sinner. You, you, God draws you to Himself. You repent. You put your trust in Christ. That's called justification, right? We understand that. God now treats us as, as if we were Christ. He sees us through the blood of Christ. We've been set free. This is justification. Now, way down here, when we die, we're going to heaven. And when we go to heaven, He's going to change us. That's called glorification. We'll be given new bodies and all those kind of things. But guess what? Uh, There's a life that we're left to live from down there when we're justified all the way down here when we're glorified. And the big fancy church word for that is something called sanctified or sanctification. What does that mean? That's the grueling process, and it is grueling. It's not easy. That's the grueling process by which, listen, by which the Holy Spirit of God is conforming us, and listen to this, and making us into who we already are. You get that? What do you mean? We're already, we're, we're, we're sinless in Christ. We're redeemed. We're saved. We're pure. That's the way God sees us in Christ. But we know when we wake up in each morning, we're, we're not that way. Really, are we? In real-time life, we're not always that way. We yell at our parents. We yell at our children. We yell at our spouses. We're tempted to do stupid stuff. We do stupid stuff. We get angry. We get jealous. We get resentful. We hold grudges. We steal. We lie. We cheat. We know that. So what God is saying, He's saying, man, that time here, He's conforming us, and He's working on us, and He's killing that indwelling sin that's within us. Question four. My kids gave me this thing here, this whatever you kind of call a watch, this smart watch or something. I can't even, it's so, so smart it doesn't tell time. Or I'm too dumb, I can't tell time. Question four. Here we go. 
What is our motivation to mortify the deeds of the body? In other words, why should we kill sin? Four quick reasons. Number one is this. Sin yields a miserable crop. When we sow the wind, we will reap what? You know that Bible verse? Sow the wind, reap what? The whirlwind. Listen, sin never prospers. It never brings joy. Oh, it brings temporary happiness. Temporary. I mean, if it didn't, it wouldn't be fun, right? I mean, sin wouldn't be no challenge whatsoever if it wasn't fun. If it wasn't enjoyable in some way, we would never sin. But it's temporary. It always brings confusion and tumult. So one reason we kill sin is because it does us no good. But number two, another reason why we kill sin, my sin disgraces the Spirit of God. The Bible says it is at enmity with God. In other words, listen, the indwelling sin that's within us will never sign a peace treaty with God. God doesn't just wink and pat it on the back and say, oh, I know you're okay. The sin within us hates God. Do you understand that? John Owen writes, he, I'll quote him again, he says, Here lies the formal nature of every sin. It is an opposition to God, a casting off His yoke, a breaking off the dependence which the creature ought to have on the Creator. Just a disgrace to God my sin is. It's like this, the, the Holy Spirit living within us, and we're going to sin. Y- You can't say, oh, you know what? I'm going to go spend time with a a, a prostitute. Holy Spirit, you just you stay out here for an hour or two or a day or two or whatever. You just stay out here, and I'm going to go over here and do this. It doesn't work that way. Or I'm about to unleash some anger. I'm about to surgically carve up someone with words, vicious, angry words. Holy Spirit, just kind of plug your ears right now. It doesn't work that way. Or, I decide to live a woe is me life. Woe is me. Nothing goes my way. The sky is always gray. I'm never blessed. People are out against me. Blah, 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 blah. But Holy Spirit, just don't pay attention to that. It doesn't work that way. Do you understand that that indwelling sin, whatever it might be, is totally offensive to God? A third motivation for killing sin, and maybe the most important one, is because Jesus shed his blood for that sin. So when we're tempted by that sin, we should just drag it to the cross and render it dead. But number four, and and maybe if you don't take anything else out of what I've said this day, I, I want you to get this. A fourth motivation for continually killing sin is this, for our great joy and our happiness. For our great joy and happiness. Psalm 37, 4 says this. Delight in the Lord. And you know what the rest of it says? And He will give you the desires of your heart. Delight in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. And when we're conforming to His will, there is joy and happiness the world cannot comprehend. Listen, listen. it's, It's a monumental leap from a baby Christian, I believe, to a mature believer in understanding what I'm talking about right now. And it is this... That, that I will believe that whatever it is, whatever that sin is that gratifies me in whatever it way m- may be, that God has something better. And that when I'm tempted by this sin, that I would lay it before God and say, God, I think I need that, but I really don't. What I really need is you. And when we do that, listen, y- y'all know this. Those of you who are mature believers, you know this. There, there is so much joy in life by doing that. It seems kind of counterproductive, doesn't it? It just seems like, well, if I can get away with this sin and I can do this stuff and have fun and still be a Christian, man, that'd be fun. No, it's not. No, it's not. What a huge hurdle between baby and mature believers. 
I think Rich Mullins, the late Rich Mullins, got it right in one of his songs. He, he, he wrote this, Surrender don't come natural to me. I'd Listen to what he says. He's talking about God. I'd rather fight you for something I don't really want than to take what you give that I need. So bring me to the last question. Maybe you're even asking this question now. But how? Preacher, how? How do we do it? How do I kill this sin? In many respects, verse 13 is sort of a paradox, isn't it? I mean, does the Spirit put to death the sin or do we put to death the sin? How do we mortify the sin? Romans 8, 5, and 6 gives us a clue and takes us down a road that, that will give us an answer. Romans 8, 5, and 6 say this, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. So we live if we set our minds on the things of the Spirit. Okay, so we're living. This is what Christians do, setting our minds on the things of the Spirit. Well, what does that mean? 1 Corinthians 2, 13 and 14 helps us there. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit. In, listen, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural man, the natural person, does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. For they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So we're setting our minds on him. And listen, the word of God is what it is. So the things of the Spirit are the words of God. Ephesians 6, 17, you remember that? Uh, Ephesians 6, he's talking about put on the armor of God. And you put on all this armor, and there's one piece of armor that's offensive. That's the sword of the Spirit. That's the word of God. So... I might be losing you here, but hang on here. Here's what he's saying. What are we doing? It's the Word and the Spirit. The Word and the Spirit. What do I do to bring to bear the Word and the Spirit so that my sin might die? How do I do that? How do I kill it with the Word and the Spirit? Galatians 3.5 says this. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing by faith? There it is. Do you understand it? Do you hear what he's saying? We hear the Word and we bring faith to believe. And we are promised then that the Holy Spirit will be killing that sin. And we keep killing it the same way that we're saved. By faith. By faith. So how does it work? Well, perhaps your besetting sin is cutting down people. Or having to prove that you're always right by using a razor sharp tongue. And so what happens, and you've done your part, you're, you're, you've memorized God's Word, you're hiding God's Word in your heart, and God then, by the Holy Spirit, will pull that sword out time after time after time and remind you, maybe sometimes quietly, a soft answer turns away wrath. Be slow to speak, slow to anger, that kind of thing. I'm only touching the tip of the iceberg here, y'all, and I could go on and on forever. Um, as, as I kind of conclude this and I put together some final thoughts, initially I put together 27 of them. Um, let me go through a brief list really quickly. Just some final thoughts. Crucifixion was a slow death. Maybe mortifying should be looked at that way. In other words, we're not going to kill it just like that. It will take time. Number two, seasons of quiet don't mean it's dead. It's replenishing. Your sin won't just go to sleep. And we don't go to sleep on it either. Never assume that it's dead. You ever seen it? You, you, you kill a snake, some of those poisonous snakes, you chop their head off. You ever heard of that? Chop the head of the snake off and you go, and the, the head still bites you and can kill you? Never assume, man, that, that I've whipped that sin. Right? Oh, I've got past this sin. You, you think that you've gotten past that sin. It, it's gone. It's never going to be there. So I don't have to spray any more around. Oh, yes, you do. That's when we spray the most. Because it's never going to go away. Number three, if you have no sense of struggle, war, or desire to kill sin within you, you're in a very precarious position. Number four, whatever, the next one. Let me skip that for time's sake. I'm going to skip all this. Get down to the... Bottom line, 
So back to where I was in Virginia, in this yard where there was kudzu, and uh, I'd done a pretty good job of keeping kudzu out for a year or something like that, and one day, kind of in the late fall, uh, I'm pushing my lawnmower, cutting grass, and, you know, going up, and I look over there, I kind of, I look over there, in the neighbor's yard, in a tree, guess what's there? Yep, there's a kudzu thing going on up there. No, not in my neighborhood, that ain't going to happen. So I go over there in the neighbor's yard, and I start grabbing this thing, and it is, I can't pull it apart. I cannot pull that thing out. I pull and pull. Finally, I take that cudgel, and I put it here, and I wrap myself around it. I turn around about three or four times, and then I put all my weight on that thing, just pulling, pulling, pulling. I fell, yeah, I fell down, but that kudzu came up. I was victorious. Always killing that kudzu, right? I just left it there. I didn't, didn't even care. Kind of in the fall, so I didn't cut grass every week. So two weeks later, I come back. I'm cutting grass. And I look down there, and there's that kudzu. Now, it's dead, right? It's just this big old thing of dead kudzu laying there. I'm like, <laughs> I got a lawnmower. I'm going to chop that bad boy up. Just going to put the nail in the coffin, right? Take that lawnmower and roll over it. Stops. It choked my lawnmower. <laughs> and you see, that kudzu will never die. It's out to get us. And that indwelling sin is clinging in your soul to your heart that's averse to everything God has for you is never dying. And we are to keep on killing sin. Keep on killing sin. Keep on killing sin. Christians, be glad today that you are averse to this cancer in the heart the kudzu of your soul, but plead with God to spur us on that, me, that we might not be satisfied where we are, but that each day when we wake up that we may say something like this, God, um, Lord, I am very prone to look at things below. I'm very prone to, to gratify the things on this earth. Lord, this is kind of where I'm living my life. Oh God, uh, command me. Command me to seek the things that are above. Command me to, 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 to want you, God, more than anything else. And then what you command, grant me that I might do it. That I might keep my eyes on Christ and not be infatuated with the stuff on this earth. Well, let me end by saying this. For the most part, today, what I've been preaching about has been for Christians, right? It's been for those who have known that you needed a Savior. You know that your sin would send you to hell and you've repented of your sin and you've turned and you've trusted Christ. And the message for you has been basically this. In Christ, Listen, you have already been freed from the penalty of sin. That should almost make Baptists speak in tongues. It should almost make us just go, I mean, glory to God. Because of what He's done, we are no longer held accountable for the penalty of sin. But right now, through the power of the Holy Spirit, believer, you are being delivered by the, from the power of sin of sin and one day way down here remember when this happens you're going to be delivered from the very presence of sin that's good news but if you're here today without Christ guess what not only uh, down here not only will you not even be here you're not even here on the race you're still down here and if you're to die right now, you know as well as I do right now that you know there's a God. You know there's a holy God. You know it. You, know, you might try to dismiss it, but you know it. There is a holy God, and one day you will give an answer to this God. You've heard that enough, and you know it. And you also know this, that Jesus came, and that whoever believes in Him would never perish and have everlasting life. 
And if I repent and I give my life to Christ and I receive His forgiveness, that, that I've now become saved and He saved me from the penalty of my sin. Why in the world would anybody hear this good news and know this is the truth and yet walk out of these doors and reject Jesus and die and spend eternity in hell? Why? I beg you and I urge you today, if that's you and, you, and today you're going, you know what, I, I want to settle it once and for all. I, I do want his forgiveness. I, I do need his forgiveness. I'm, I, I want to pray with you in, in that room right across that hall. As soon as we're done here, I'll meet you over there. Well, i got to land this airplane. One final word. You're sitting out there and going, man, I do need, I do need Christ. I do need, I do need to come to Christ. And here's why I need him. Because my marriage stinks. And maybe he can fix it. Or because I've got irritable bowel syndrome or whatever it is. And maybe he can fix that. Or because I've been diagnosed with some disease. And if, you know, God can heal me of that. Those are good things. But let me, that is not why you come to Christ. You come to Christ because we're a sinner in need of a Savior. And he's the only way to heaven. But he is the way. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Would you come to him today? Church, let's, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the patience of these people. Um, what a beautiful testimony of, Lord, you working in our hearts and our lives. Our God, our Father, we confess to you that unless you work in us, we'll never hate sin like we should. We'll never kill it. We're incapable of killing it day by day. We'd rather relax and rest. So God, please command what you will of us and grant us what you command. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's stand together as we reflect and respond this morning. I hope this is the prayer of our hearts. I surrender all.
we go today, I want us to go with this song. Um, again, I hope it's the prayer of our hearts that our all the parts of our lives are surrendered completely to Jesus. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Let's sing as we go. Take my dismissed.